Hello and welcome to the Tennis Menu's Daily French Open Show. I'm your host, Val Febo, and we're here for the TennisMenu.com. And remember, you can get an annual subscription for only $99.90 US to make yourself the best tennis coach you can be. Head to the TennisMenu.com to get that package, and it is absolutely fantastic. We have got a massive edition of the show today because last night in the men's draw, Things started to escalate. Dominic Team and Rafael Nadal continue their collision course. Team with a sensational win over Casper Ruud. Stan Wawrinka gone in five over young Frenchman Hugo Gaston. Gaston is the uh, lowest ranked player since 2002 to reach the Roland Garros fourth round. Unbelievable effort from the young Frenchman. We thought Marco Cecchinato would be able to defeat Alexander Zverev. Well, Zverev served brilliantly last night to hold on in a straight set victory. Plenty to get through on the women's side as well with Simona Halep in ominous form. Caroline Garcia coming back from a set and a breakdown. We'll chat about that. Kiki Burton's also recovering from injury as well. And that's something that we will touch on with how to get over a cramp. Along with why are the lower ranked players doing so well? We have got plenty to get through on today's program. But we can't do it without these two men and one of which is the best high performance coach in the business. His name is Mark Safoulis. Mark, how are you, mate? I'm going well, Val, and obviously um, an incredible night on the men's side where you've got two players outside the top 200 in the world getting through, and that's an incredible feat for both of those players. And to just imagine how a player that's 239 in the world um, gets through and beats a, a Grand Slam champion, uh, which is amazing. And he's actually lost four of his last um, challenger matches, so not even on, on the tour, uh, you know, the high-end tour matches, which is incredible for him. And we're going to definitely go down that path today and talk about that. And what a great recovery from Hannibal Lecter. And to be able to get through and, um, and get through a match last night was incredible. So, Kiki Burton, well done on recovering from uh, probably what looked like a, a cramp that was going to end her life. And she's actually come through and, and done a great job. So, yeah, lots to talk about today. Yeah, there definitely is. And our resident uh, multilingual speaker, Joel Frucci, is here, our translator. How are you? Yeah, going well, mate. I think I'm going to stick with the English this morning. But uh, yeah, I'm going well. More importantly, though, how are you going? Because, uh, yeah, you didn't wake up all that happy this morning. No, I was very flat. These, these, <laughs> these, these idiots. Um, oh, it was just there was just a terrible night. Absolutely terrible. They, they could have won. It was ill-disciplined with 50-meter penalties. And you know what? I'm saying it. The umpires, if any AFL umpires are listening now, I know it's not tennis, you are terrible. You are terrible people. You're playing with people's lives. <laughs> You're terrible. All right, let's, let's continue. I'm starting off on a bang. Um, but no, uh, Hugo Gaston, I think that's the one that we should start with here. And he's the first player to bagel Sandra Brinker in, an, uh, in a Grand Slam since Novak Djokovic did at the Australian Open 2015 semifinals. And I remember that night because Djokovic seemingly, well, he had all the injuries in the fourth set that night, but apparently uh, they all went away in the fifth. And then uh, also, he's the, I think, lowest ranked player to uh, beat Stan Wawrinka at a Grand Slam at 239 in the world. He's, so get this, guys. He was born in September 2000. Mary Pierce was France's last Grand Slam champion at the French Open in 2000. So he still has, he hasn't seen a French, a French Grand Slam champion in his lifetime. And he's still in the draw carrying the French hopes in this, uh, in this Roland Garros. And yeah, it was an epic win over Stan last night. And it's one that I didn't think would happen because Stan, look, Stan looked in pretty good form. And Mark, talk us through, I think, the mentality of someone that's, that's ranked so... or The steely resolve, I guess, of losing the fourth set and then to bagel someone that's been there and done that like Stan Vavrinka. Yeah, I guess the, the biggest thing with players of that ranking is that it's a win-win scenario because he's never been this far in a Grand Slam, probably ever. Um, and it's one of those things that you, if you win the match, great, it's a bonus. If you lose a match, wow, I've done a great job and I've lost to a good player. So he, he has nothing to lose in a situation where you're playing one of the best players that has been obviously part of the last 15 years of the men's tour. And, you know, he just goes out and swings and that's all you, you have to do. I mean, you've got nothing to lose when you're a player ranked 239 in the world. And this is a great pay packet for him. I, I remember seeing something last night around um, he's only, I think he's, he's, career prize money is like 170000 and he's walked away already so far with $225,000. So um, he's, he's made more prize money in this tournament than he has for his whole career so far. And incredible to, to even imagine him and also uh, Corder, Sebastian Corder getting through it, the rankings they are. But 
you know, it's it's one of those tournaments that anything's possible with the conditions and the time of year that it's at, and obviously COVID allowing the opportunity for these players that are probably outside the normal cut of a, uh, a Grand Slam to be able to get in and have an opportunity to win. And that, to me, has been the big bonus of uh, this tournament this year. And Gaston, wow, what, what an incredible match to come back and, uh, you know, lose the first set. And you, you'd probably think, you know, a player of that level would say, well, I'm down a set to Arenka, you know, at least I'm here, at least it's an opportunity, whatever, um, I've done enough. But he fought back, won the next two, lost the fourth set. And could again go on, you know, oh, that's okay. I've, I've taken him to five. It's a great opportunity. But to beat him six love, I mean, that is just an absolute incredible feat for a young man and someone ranked the way he is. And it's, a, it's an awesome thing for tennis to see this happening. Is it COVID that's, that's allowed these, young, these lower ranked players? And you sent me a stat this morning that um, before today, uh, I, for, for 18 years, a player ranked outside the top 200 hadn't reached the last 16 of men's singles at Roland Garros. It's happened twice. And then the only two players to reach uh, the fourth round of a Grand Slam before winning a challenger title were Luka Pui and Milos Ranić. And now it's happened an extra two times uh, with Korda and Gaston. So is it COVID or are they just that good? Well, they are that good, but... Yeah. Uh, look, I think players at that level, and people underestimate um, a ranking. You know, a player at 300 in the world is just as good a ball striker as someone in the top 100. And it's, it, it, the, the differences are very minor. It comes down to some consistency in what they do and making sure they can do that on a more regular basis. Um, but it also comes down to the ability to, to, to pay for things week in, week out. It's very hard for a player of that level. And, you know, you, you think of a where Renka would have had a, a coaching team with him, you know, how, how long for. This guy's probably on his own. I mean, he's in France, so he's probably got some support crew around him. But to be able to travel on tour with a support team is not easy. So these guys are just as good as the top 100. They are. There's not much difference. It's just the consistency of what they do with it is the main thing. So COVID has given them an opportunity, which is great. Well, not saying just these guys, but most of the guys in general at this ranking. The opportunity has been given. But to take it is another level. And well done to those, those two boys in particular. You know, I think it's a great thing for tennis. And, and I think people or players, and it's been said this for a long time, of the lower rank need more opportunity, more prize money to give them a better chance to, uh, to be successful in this sport. Yep, the difference between best and worst. And that's what we've spoken about for, throughout this tournament and throughout the US Open show as well. But Joel... Uh, moving on to you, Dominic Team and Rafa Nadal continue on their collision course for that semi-final epic that we're hoping to get because it is a tantalising prospect. But Team against Rude last night, that was one that we, I think, we penciled in at the start of the tournament, saying, okay, that's a nut, like a probably a third test in a row for Team with Chilich. Then he would have faced Sock and a or a Pelka. He faced Sock, beat him in straight. Then Casper Rude, semis in Rome, semis in Hamburg, and now Team has just dispatched him. How ominous is this? Yeah, it is quite ominous. Uh, what was most impressive about Dominic last night, I think, um, certainly the couple of shots that, that stood out, um, when you're feeling good, you, you, you definitely make these shots. Maybe when you're, you're not feeling so good, you maybe miss them. But there are a couple of uh, backhand winners uh, down the line where Dominic team really, all he, he didn't have a lot of time um, to prepare for the shot, wind back. All he really had to do was... Just uh, give a give a little flick of the wrist, and uh, he pulled off some incredible backhand winners um, down the line. Casper uh, really didn't really have uh, any answer. It only took a few uh, breaks for, for Dominic Team. Uh, in the end, unfortunately, we won't we won't get that team versus uh, Vavrinka battle. But it'll be interesting to see how he prepares for Hugo Gaston. Um, probably not a player that Dominic's had a lot to do with uh, in the past. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, his camp goes about that one. Yeah, I think so. And he's taken down Casper, the unfriendly ghost, and then he's taken, and then he's up against Gaston, the villain from Beauty and the Beast. So he's he's just going to have to take <laughs> take down all these lovable cartoon characters. Or oh, actually, Gaston was the villain, so he's not that lovable, but uh, he thought he was. But um, yeah, so Dominic Team's got his work cut out for him because he's going to have the French hopes on his shoulders here, Hugo Gaston. But uh, Rafa Nadal looked really good against Stefano Travaglia. Adds another bagel to his tally, so another, so it's just ridiculous. I think that's 111 at uh, at Roland Garros now for Rafael Nadal, only dropping five games. But um, Alexander Zverev against, so it was a mixed day for the Italians. They had two go through to the fourth round and two lose. So Lorenzo Sonego got through 1917 in the third set tiebreak against Taylor Fritz. That's epic. But Marco and Yannick Sinner got through over Federico Coria. But 
Alexander Zverev, this isn't one that we thought was actually going to, to go to the German. I think all three of us both thought checking or sorry, all three of us all thought that Chekinato would get through. Um, six one seven five six three. Mark Zverev served particularly well today. It's probably the best he served since the tennis restart. Um, talk us through the numbers and and what you thought he did well. Yeah, he served incredibly well, and, it, and obviously over the U.S. Open and the French Open, he hasn't served fantastically well, and his second serve has been a, a big hindrance in his game. But um, Chekinato couldn't really expose him because he actually served quite well today, and, and it was a really challenging one. And I think Chekinato just really didn't expose the weaknesses of Zverev enough on the day, and that was that was the big thing. I think the the slowness of the courts is probably what hurt him. Um, on the day, and obviously, you know, to be able to to pressure Zverev, you need to get some depth and some speed on the ball. Um, the conditions probably didn't play into his favour in that respect, but you can't take it away from Zverev. I mean, he was outstanding on the day, and well done to him to get through. And obviously, you know, backing up from a great US Open, and we all probably sat here at the start of the tournament in our preview show and thought, eh, how's it going to affect him mentally? He's a bit of a fruitcake, so is it going to get to him uh, that he's lost that match? Is he going to really struggle to come back and fight back from it? So, um, he's definitely answered the critics and then done a great job to get to this point. And playing a young guy in, in uh, Yannick Sinner is going to be a real challenge. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to say it. He can't lose to two, two Italians. They're going to sit there together over a bowl of buster tonight and they're going to chat about <laughs> how to take this guy down. And I think Sinner is in a really good position. He's playing some really good tennis to be able to really challenge very so do I. I think he's playing wonderfully well at the moment. And uh, some of the fourth round matchups are pretty tantalizing. And a man that's flown really under the radar throughout this tournament is Diego Schwartzman. He hasn't dropped a set yet, the Rome finalist. And uh, he took down our friend Norbert uh, Gombos, uh, 7-6-6-3-6-3. He looks in really ominous form. And he'll take on uh, Lorenzo Sonigo in the fourth round, but then could set up a quarterfinal clash with Dominic Team. Um, he's by no means um, having a bad tournament. He's been absolutely fan- fantastic. But what do you say? Like, for someone of his height, it's just, it, Joel, it just doesn't seem as though, and, and you did an article on this at, um, a, a couple of weeks ago on, on our Tennis Menu blog section, if you head to the tennismenu.com, tiny but mighty, um, some of the best mm. modern, modern players of 175 centimetres or less. Um, Doing that research, what did you find and, and where and looking at sort of Schwartzman's recent results, is there any indication that maybe if he does somehow get through team, can he beat Nadal again? Yeah, well, the the smattering of players that I looked at, the majority of them were uh, clay quarters primarily, probably except a guy like like Michael Chang, I think. But um, there were a lot of grinders and not a lot of grand slams one in there there were a few uh but not a lot so but look i think if diego schwartzman is really going to push on uh up into the later stages of of the slam you would have to think that uh this is probably his best chance obviously he's in good form that goes without saying but for a guy of 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 his height uh you know given the what we've been saying about the courts and the height of the bounce and, and the speed of the ball the speed of the courts you have to assume that this is probably his his best chance to, to win. I, I certainly think that he can get through uh, Lorenzo Sinego, um in in the next round. So yeah, I think you'll I think you'll get through that. Whether he can get past the guy like Dominic Team, I'm I'm not quite sure. Um, as we said before, Team's just playing with a lot of confidence. He's really hitting freely. But um, you know, I guess the fact that Diego has gone under the radar could really work uh, work in his in his favour. I mean, no one's really sort of talking about him. I'm sure uh, guys like Dominic Team and Rafael Nadal and, and Novak Djokovic, for them, he's probably not flying under the radar. They've probably taken a lot of notice of him. But from the outside, um, the fact that no one's really saying much about him, could that work in his favour? Potentially, yes. Definitely. And uh, the, the, those fourth round matchups that we spoke about, Nadal v. Korda, Sinner v. Zverev, Team v. Gaston and Schwartzman against Sonigo. So that's going to be uh, tantalising. A few of those are really, really exciting matchups. So I can't wait to see what happens as we get into the second week of Roland Garros in men's singles. But we'll move on to the women's side of things. And Simona Halep looked, oh, she just, she was awesome last night against Amanda Anasimova. Anasimova took her out last year at the French Open. And well, that was just a complete, 180 because this it, it, Halep just killed her six love six one it was just it was a demolition derby it was almost you don't you you 
didn't want to watch anymore, but you couldn't look away because <laughs> the family, it was just getting more and more damaging. But it was just, it was, it was awesome from Simona Halep. Like words cannot describe what she did last night. Uh, Caroline Garcia, well, unbelievable. I watched the start of this match and at least Mertens was all over her. Uh, it was up a set and a break, six one four. Uh, sorry, one six six four seven five in favour of the French woman who continues her good form. And look, this might be something in what I brought up on uh, day two, Mark, when. Um, or our day one review when Caroline Garcia beat Annette Conservate she struggles playing against the French Open with the French Open crowd there's nobody there so she's loving it <laughs> she is no pressure just go out there and hit some balls and um, obviously you know it's a, it's a challenge playing in your own country as we did mention on day two um, and we've had that with Australian players forever but um, the biggest thing for her is once the the weight is off the shoulders. She's an incredible player. She's shown it over a long period of time that she can really play this game. And uh, she's actually playing some really free tennis and playing as the underdog too. Like, you know, she's playing a few players that are, you know, uh, ranked above her, probably in better form than her. Um, and yet she's just having a crack. And that's at the end of the day, you know, when you've got no pressure on yourself, you just go out there and, and feel free to swing and no, no one's going to have a, have a crack at you in the crowd and the tabloids aren't going to worry about it because it's not really huge at the moment, the French Open. Um, but it's just having a go and it's a win-win scenario for her. She's playing some, some great tennis and who knows, could, could this be the year of the French? I mean, it could be one of those tournaments that, you know, you've got a, a few of the Frenchies getting through and, and playing some good tennis with no, no pressure on them. Yeah, and I think you're right, Mark. I think she's flourishing in the in these conditions and without the without the crowd there. And it's something that maybe Tennis Australia could look at for Sam Stoza, possibly for one last uh, run at the uh, at the Australian <laughs> Open. Who knows? Because it could it could very well work. She sometimes feels the pressure, um, but we do love Sam, and it'd be great to see her have maybe one final long run at the Australian Open. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure that we will get that. But Kiki Burton's Mark and Joel um, look. After Joel, Joel, you ran us through it so beautifully. What happened uh, in the in the uh, Sarah Arani and the the language was was fantastic. And look, she walked off. It all didn't. She didn't walk off. She was wheeled off in a in a wheelchair um, with some severe cramp. But she came over to Katarina Siniakova last night. Are you at all surprised by what happened here? Um. No, not not really, to be honest. Um, I guess you know a player of Kiki Burton's standing. You're you're really looking at probably these matches and 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 saying that um, that she wins these. So it was good to see her bounce back from that. Despite as as we keep saying, uh, leaving the court looking like uh, something akin to Hannibal Lecter. Um, but what I'm really interested in is how she would have recovered from that match and got herself ready for this one. So, I mean, Mark, I'm sure that you haven't. Uh, been probably in a camp where a player has has pulled up quite as badly as Kiki did in that last match. But um, if if you are in that kind of situation, um, what kind of things are you are you doing after a match like that to get ready for uh, for two days' time? Uh, like, what's your routine? Yeah, it's a good question because I've had a few times where players have uh, yeah got basically some heat stroke and cramped and full body cramps, and Australian Open time can be absolutely brutal. Um, and that's probably the, the challenging part. But after a match, I mean, you look at uh, the, the rumor was she actually got, she was 45 minutes before she stopped cramping, which is a real challenge. But you've got to get your electrolytes in and salts in and, um, you know, uh, high salt meals. Um, you, you're obviously trying to keep yourself moving a little bit, uh, not to, to sort of sit still for too long, get your water intake right up, make sure your hydration levels are there. There wouldn't have been much training the next day if, if if she wasn't feeling great. So you probably would have bypassed a bit of that or had a light hit later in the afternoon. Because um, not only does, I mean, once you stop cramping, people think that's it, but your muscles have been in spasm and they actually tighten up quite severely. So there would have been a lot of massage. There would have been a lot of, a lot of um, looking after the body in that way. So, I mean, it's a, luckily it's a grand slam because you've got that day in between and that's probably where it probably helped her. And, you know, I wasn't sure whether she'd come up. I mean, it's one of those things that is a very challenging thing to go through. Um, and it looked like her forearms were cramping as well. So whether or not, the, you know, grip, gripping the racket would have been hard if she was still a bit tight in the hand. So, I mean, you'd say that there would have been great medical teams around her to help her out. But, uh, yeah, it is never a good sight seeing a player actually go through full body cramp. It's actually, I've, I've had half body cramp, full cramp, and that is painful enough. Um, it's just because I was unfit, not because I was 
dehydrated <laughs> anything, um, and trying to play some footy back in the back end of my uh, my playing days. But um, yeah, it's it's never an easy thing to feel to go through, and it, it can take a few days to recover from. So yeah, she's obviously recovered amazingly well, and um, yeah, Lazarus is back again. So well done, it's good. <laughs> How many nicknames has this woman had during this tournament? <laughs> Hannibal Ecker, Lazarus. I'm sure there's going to be something else by the time, by the next yeah. time she plays. But no, absolutely phenomenal effort from uh, Kiki Burton's. Uh, Alina Spitalina continues her run of form as well over a Katarina Alexandrova, 6 4, a 7 5. Iga Swiatek over Eugenie Bouchard, 6 3. Six to Barbara Krejcikova ending Svetlana uh, Peronkova's run at the French Open uh, five seven six four six three Nadia Podoroska over Anna Karolina Schmedlova six three six two the world number one hundred and thirty one from Argentina continuing her run at this Roland Garros into the fourth round for the first time of her career and Martina Trevisan. Well, we've got an Italian in the. We've got a lot of Italians in uh, still in the men's draw, and uh, well, she continues on the women's side as well with a massive win over Maria Sakari. One six was down six four in the second set tiebreak, saved two match points to win the next two sets seven six six three. But uh, tonight's matches, guys, we've got some unbelievable. I think we, well, I'm excited about a couple of them. I reckon Matteo Berrettini over against Daniel Altmaier might be quite interesting. Altmaier can play some pretty solid tennis when he wants to. Irina Barra against Sophia Kennan. I reckon we could see an upset there from the young... Oh, she, I was going to say from the young Romanian. She's actually older than Kennan, so I wouldn't call her well, the youngish Romanian, I should say. Um, Fiona Ferrer against Patricia Maria Tig uh, on Chatrier. That's not one I thought that would be on Chatrier, but Fiona Ferrer carrying the French hopes. Uh, Novak Djokovic against Daniel Alani Galan. Um, Roberta Batista Agu against Pablo Carreño Busta. This one is going to go five hours, I reckon. That one, just with, with the form that they're both in. Um, Only five. <laughs> really, yeah, well, look, maybe seven. Who knows? It could be a, rep, a repeat of John Isner v. Nicolas Mahou. Uh, we don't know, but their serves aren't as good as what uh, Mahu and Isner's were on the grass. Um, Clay is a much easier to break serve. But uh, Stefano Tsitsipas in action as well. Petra Kvitova. Uh, Dan- Danielle Collins against Gabinia Muguruza. Really excited to see what happens there. Kevin Anderson against Andre Rublev. Roberto Carbayes Baena against Grigor Dimitrov. I- Look, I'm a little bit upset at Roberto because he has robbed us of Dimitrov v. Shapovalov in the third round, and I really wanted to see that. So I'm very I'm upset, but I reckon the Spaniard might be able to get a set off the Bulgarian. Uh, Yelena Ostapenko in action as well. Arena Sablenka against Anjabur. Christian Garin against Karen Kashinov. Martin Fushevich uh, in action as well as Petra Martic. So we have a bumper uh, schedule tonight. I reckon, hopefully, we do see some five setters like we have done over the first few day, over the first eleven days of the tournament, uh, including qualifying. But yeah, it's going to be very exciting tonight. Mark Sapulis, thank you very much for your part in the show. Thank you very much, Val and, uh, and Joel. And yeah, obviously, looking forward to some great tennis tonight. I'm really looking forward to actually Savalenka and Jabor. Um, Savalenka is a fitness coach. is a very good friend of mine. And obviously, on Jabor, we had Shane Leonard yesterday on the show. And uh, she, you know, obviously has, has done got one of her best results on clay so far, and had a great 2020. And Shane was a little bit modest. He's uh, he's definitely the brains behind a lot of these results. So uh, you know, looking forward to seeing seeing that that match tonight. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Novak's going to see him roll his way through once again. And uh, yeah, a bit scary that he's playing so well. But looking forward to tonight's tennis. So thanks, guys, for the show again. Me too. Well done, Mark and uh, Joel Frigi. Have you got any other languages to to leave us with, or uh, no, I don't tonight. Um, yeah, I might, I might just keep, keep it with the old uh, Inglés. Uh, yeah, but no, thanks for the show, boys. It was good, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Say Jen, Joel. Say Jen. We win. We win. Goodbye in Chinese. Um, that's oh, that's okay. all I remember from uh, doing Chinese up until year 10 at school. That's uh, hello and goodbye. And how to count to 10, that's literally it. But uh, yeah, it's a, let's move on because we probably do need to wrap this up. It's getting a bit loose now. Um, yeah, Mark Sapulis, <laughs> Joel Fritchie, thank you for joining me, Val Febo. Remember, you can head to the tennismenu.com and subscribe to our annual package for just $99.90 US to make yourself a better tennis coach. It's an absolutely fantastic uh, n- initiative that Mark's p- uh, put together and yeah, brilliantly done by him, Nick, George, Joel. Um, I'm included in that, but I only do the new stuff and, uh, and also um, Callum and Nick coming aboard as well. So awesome stuff. And uh, hopefully uh, tonight's action is good. We'll catch you tomorrow on the Tennis Menu's Daily Rolling Garros Show.